You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 65. On this episode of the show, we catch you up on what we've been up to, and we talk a little bit about regulations, what's been changing, what you like, and what you don't like. All right, welcome to this, the 65th episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We are your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting, I'm Josh Palm, your host of the show. If you want to check out HP Outdoors, you can catch up with us on hpoutdoors.com, across all of the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Um, iTunes is where you can find all of the past episodes, Stitcher, all of your your popular podcast directories. If you want to shoot us an email, you can do that too. Info at HP Outdoors is where you can get us there. And when I say us, of course, I mean myself and my esteemed partner in crime joining me today as he always does mr minivan dan what's up dan uh not too much my friend it's good to be back here talking with you and i uh, got a couple of hunts under the belt so far this year and seeing a lot of other guys across the nation out there you know just crushing them already so uh you know we're back in the swing of things i think we had a couple comments saying that uh America has won wars quicker than we put out episodes, so uh, here we are. It's good to be back. Yeah, there uh, has been some uh, unrest amongst the the (laughs) HP following for our lack of producing a podcast, and uh, we understand the disgruntlement. Um, You know, it's just one of those things where, you know, again, we've kind of said it from the beginning, We're, we're average dudes that just, you know, on top of this, have a complete full life of everything else that we've got going on. And just sometimes it's harder than others, you know? And, uh, you know, most people may not believe, you know, realize how, how difficult it is for us sometimes to coordinate a time that works for both of us. But, uh, like you, I'm glad to be back and be able to spend a few t- minutes here, kind of getting everybody caught up on what we've been up to and talking a little bit about regulations. You know, it's one, it's one of those things. It's kind of a necessary evil, I think. And, this year has been some some changes to those regulations, some that have been popular, some that have not been popular. And then there's obviously some some regs out there that guys want changed. And we reached out to our listeners that uh, are part of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast listeners group. And we we solicited some information from them about their thoughts on regulations and, and got some good feedback there. Um, so if you're not in the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast listeners group on Facebook, definitely check us out. And we've been growing like crazy in there. We're up over a thousand thousand members in there now. So I know we're working on trying to get a little something together to kind of say thank you for everybody being in there. So there's still there's still time if you've not joined up the group yet. Definitely check us out if you have any trouble finding it on um, on Facebook. Feel free to message uh, our Facebook page, the HP Outdoors page, or Dan or myself directly, and we'll get you squared away there. Um, you know. Being that I'm, I'm gonna just sidetrack for just a second. Being that Dan is a world-renowned photographer and all of these other what? amazing things on top of on top of minivan, you know, uh, modification <laughs> professional. Um, when we look at our Instagram following, he's got like I don't know 550 million followers, and I've got like six or so. Uh, so I'm gonna make a shameless plug. Josh underscore Palm. Oh, on there you go. Yeah, get let it. Me, let me let me try to run Dan down a little bit. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, uh, Dan, what's your Instagram handle again? Uh, D Harishka one. At D Harishka one. That's right. Yeah, check us out on Instagram as well as our HP Outdoor stuff because we do you know post some of our own kind of stuff and you know stuff on there too. So uh, I can't really speak for Dan, but I, I don't really fa- I don't really get on Facebook much anymore. I get in, I get in the listeners group and that's about it. Twitter is pretty much dead to me. Um, except for during football Saturdays when I'm watching the Penn state game. Uh, otherwise I can't deal with the politics on there. So yeah, Facebook kind of Instagram 
pretty much is where where you can find me if you're interested on yeah. social media. Facebook is such a it's a hundred percent argument now. So the the listeners group, I get in there and and dabble and respond and have fun with the guys and just take a bashing ninety five percent of the time. But I enjoy it. It's fun and like you said, just. I'm not, I've never been a, a Twitter guy, but Instagram, I enjoy that just because it's, you know, good pictures and you don't have the politics. So that's good stuff. But well, here's, here's the deal about Facebook, man. Um, you know, there's a lot of groups on there and Facebook can be an amazing resource, but most of these groups, you can't post anything without people just annihilating you for whatever reason. I mean, it is crazy the amount of, you know, you know, internet tough guys that are out there and, you know, experts and all this other crap. I mean, legitimately, if you are a person that just has a general question about waterfowl hunting and, you know, you want a, a place where you can ask it and not be ridiculed for it, the HP Outdoors group is is where you need to be because it, it's a bunch of guys in there that, uh, you know, are, are, are waterfowl hunters and you know, it's nothing more than that. It's just a bunch of dudes that are good and gals, you know, there's guys and girls in there, obviously that are just, you know, more laid back. It's a, it's, I don't want, I hate the term safe space. Cause that's such a negative <laughs> connotation <laughs> with like millennials and everything these days, but it is a place where you can ask that quote unquote stupid question that like on any other hardcore waterfowler page or whatever other page that's out there, you will just get annihilated and you'll hate human life forever. Yep. So um, definitely, you know, if you want to come ask questions, learn, you know, from guys that have gone through the same things you're probably going through, definitely the group is, is the place for you to be. So, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. It's a, out. and it, and everyone celebrates the successes and, uh, and a lot of us can relate to the failures. So, you know, when guys get on there and say, I learned so much, this is, you know, I've, I've only been out four times, but you know, I listen to the podcast or I talk to you guys and I got my first limit. Like that's pretty, pretty awesome to see. And you know, Heck yeah. these guys are addicted for life now. So we apologize for that because your bank account will probably hurt a little bit, but even, a, even, a, you know, <laughs> the PMs you get of guys that are, you know, I got one the other day and said, Hey, you know, I saw your, uh, your, uh, minimalist challenge. So I thought I would do it. And I, I ended up with a box of shells and two decoys and I had the best hunt of my life. I limited out. So I did it. I went out again and I killed a bunch more. And so, you know, just different ideas that you bounce off one another and, you know, you, it, it's just cool, cool to be a part of. Well, yeah. And that's the thing too, you know, we, we take it pretty seriously as far as regulating kind of the discussion in there, not to say that you can't talk about whatever you want to and share your opinions, however you want, but you know, we're pretty steadfast about, you know, you're going to respect everybody in there. Um, if you just come in there to pump your outfitter or your product or, you know, your whatever, uh, we're going to boot you out. Um, you know, it's a place to come talk hunting, not invite me to like 5 million pages that you've started. You know, none of that <laughs> crap. It's just straight up dudes that hunt, that want to share the experience, ask questions, share successes, share, share failures, and just, you know, have a genuine good brotherhood in there. So, uh, that's something we definitely work on pretty hard. So I think we're, we're pretty proud of what we've kind of created there. So yeah. we have to continue to be able to build that. So talking about that no doubt. early season, what have you been doing? Oh man. Um, <laughs> this is going to, this is going to derail us. So before I get into that, that's right. Uh, Cause I got the early main, season main, stories here. So yeah, no, I know. Um, the major thing we're going to talk about in this episode is the regulations um, that have changed, that are new, that are kind of all of this stuff that's going on. We had a pretty good discussion about this in the in the listeners group, so I want to get some of that stuff out and share it. But yeah, you know, we did. We we've been away for you know, I think the quote was the Gulf War was one quicker you know than we've been <laughs> seventy nine days. The podcast is yeah. our last one. Yeah, who's counting, right? <laughs> so um, we've got a, some ground to cover as far as what we have been up to. Um, so what I will say is I have not been up to much in the, in the way of hunting here in the early season, the September season for me, the last couple years has been a bloodbath. I mean, we were just Ted bird limit per man and we were just laying them out, multiple hunts, limiting out through the September seasons this year. 
I, I went out twice. I think I killed four or five geese total. Uh, not, not a great experience. It's been hot. I've been really busy with kind of family stuff and work stuff and everything else going on. So just really haven't had a bunch of time or, uh, drive to get out, frankly, (laughs) because of the lack of birds that I've been seeing. And I will say we just closed the four day early duck season in Virginia. And I opted to sleep in today instead of going duck hunting. Um, that's the first time I've done that in, I don't know, five or six years, maybe. I mean, it's been a really long time since I just didn't go hunting because I was tired and I wanted to just sleep in. That kind of should tell you a little bit about where I'm at right now. Um, I mean, coming from me, we need, I need a cold front (laughs) big time. I I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. I need out of the 85 degree weather, uh, and you know, just all that nonsense. I need, I need it to feel like fall, man. I'm, I'm struggling big time. Yeah. I see the next, uh, two weeks in our forecast is all sixties and seventies. So for, you know, and the fifties at night, which, uh, it's just not what I want to see. Not what I want to see at all. So, so you've, you've been out on two goose hunts and you killed four birds. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, we just didn't have the resident birds that I normally see. I mean, we have one spot that routinely holds probably 200 or better birds all through the summer. And for whatever reason, uh, this year, there was like 15, maybe 20 on there. And, you know, it's just we hunted one of other spots that we do really well in the late season on. And we've seen some resident birds there, so we gave it a shot didn't even pull the trigger Hmm. so you know we ended up uh and because of my you know obligations coaching baseball and stuff with my son and and just projects around the house just trying to keep up with some stuff my (laughs) my dog has been um his ears are a disaster right now he literally had ear surgery like a month ago man um so he's had he's had like he had a hematoma in his one ear about a year ago he had a hematoma in the other year so he got an ear surgery and he's been in a cone and it's like constant cleaning, it, just a disaster. So all of that stuff has really kind of put a damper on it for me. So, you know, a lot of the guys I hunt with and stuff have been focusing more on doves and that kind of thing. And and I like the dove hunt and everything, but, you know, we had weddings to go to and stuff. So I just, you know, just biding my time at this point and trying to, trying to get to some colder weather. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot going on this September as far as just. I don't know. I ended up doing that Boulder Beast, which was 27 miles, and I didn't finish it, which I was totally okay with. So I got through 13 miles, and my step counter put me over, you know, 26 miles on a on a flat surface. So I was all right with that because my buddy ended up with uh, – he had strep infection in both of his heels that – or totally open wounds. He missed, uh, I think it was like two and a half weeks worth of work and then finally got back to half days. So, you know, I'm glad I stopped after 13 <laughs> those, miles. Those pictures <laughs> were disgusting. Dude, I they mean, were bad. some crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah, that was... Unreal. And he's ready to go again next year. I don't know if his wife will let him, but yeah, it was pretty bad. But um, so a couple stories here. Uh, early goose season... The nuisance season got out one time. We had, uh, you know, 200 plus birds hitting the field one morning. And then that night they were back. So we went out the following morning. Um, I think maybe 60 birds showed up. We ended up killing 10. Um, no, it wasn't bad. One thing that I was not happy with, and I don't even know if I, I, maybe I did talk to you when you're up here, but, um, we have chickens at our house now and I don't let my dogs, I, I only yelled at them one time for chasing the chickens and they don't chase them anymore. Well, I've been working with Kimber a little bit this off season and then we got out there and she ran the birds down, but she would not bring them back to me. And I totally correlate that with having the chickens in the yard now and not, not letting her chase them. So that's something we had to work on a little bit and it was frustrating to get out there and I guess I should have had some, some, uh, frozen birds or something to work on or with, but I didn't. So that was a kind of a bummer in the, in the initial part. And, um, 
And then, you know, back to this past weekend was our opening duck season. And, you know, we kind of say all the time that early season for us is kind of hit or miss around here. And I think it's, it's probably for where people are at, but public land around here and a lot of other places I know just get, you know, shot out of the, out of the sky pretty much. And that is to sky busters as well. But I mean, we went out and birds immediately, you can see them all day, you know, for weeks. And then they're so off course when they start hearing that bang, bang, bang. So, um, that mixed with hot weather and we scouted the spot. It's very tough to get into. And even in a canoe and getting out and pulling it over vegetation and stuff, I think Trav and I went out and we could probably only get about 200 yards off of the trail that we usually go in about 300 yards, 400 yards. So it made it difficult. We ended up sitting on a pothole of maybe about, I want to say it was about 40 yards by 15 yards wide. I mean, it was not good at all by the time we got out there, but there was nothing we could do and really no way you could see it. But usually just the, the water is down so low. So we get out there, we ended up killing five ducks. Um, it was a very, very tough. We killed them all probably within 30 yards of where we were at, but the way that the water sunk down around this vegetation, I didn't take Kimber with me because she would probably get caught up in this stuff and not be able to move. So that was a decision I made that she cried all morning and I heard about it from my wife, but (laughs) nonetheless, um, we got out there and literally, I think we shot for an hour and a half or I could, I'd say hunted for an hour and a half. And then we looked for the birds for an hour and a half. And this is stuff where, I mean, it took, it probably takes you 20 minutes to walk 30 yards just because it's, I need to get you out there, but there's no bottom to the swamp. So if you can get on vegetation and walk, that's one thing, but you fall through the vegetation and there's no bottom. Like the water, you could, you could feel some stuff about, you know, six feet deep. But other than that, I mean, you're, you're sinking. So we spent a lot of time looking for the birds, didn't come up with any birds. And it was, uh, kind of an eye opener. Cause like I said, some of these birds fell within 15 yards of us, but there was absolutely nothing we could do to find them. It's so thick. And then if they fell in and I mean, these birds were stoned, they were stoned in the air. There's no, they weren't diving. They weren't swimming to hide anywhere. And there was just no way to get through it. No way. And you know, it's one of those ethical decisions. I think next time we won't do that again, unless there's more water where we could drop them right in our hole because it was just not what we wanted to be doing. But then we got back to the, to the path where guys were sky busting all morning and they had, they had about uh, 10 wood ducks and a couple geese that they shot pretty high over, the, over the treetops. But we, you know, we were only 200 yards. So we were watching them drop and then heard the BBs landing all around us, but you know, that's public land hunting. And, uh, I don't know. That's one reason I'm not too pumped up right now. The weather, you know, we've just lack of rain. It's hot. And, you know, a lot of probably 80% of the guys only hunt opening weekend. And then you kind of have the spots to yourself. So that's been my early season so far. And, Got some shooting. I tell you, the first the first group in in the early goose season, I did go three for three out of the gate. My gun didn't malfunction at all, nice. and I was pretty. Well, that's good to hear. I was pretty pretty pumped about that. So, but you know, it was good to be out. Good to be watching the the sunrise and hearing those birds. Man, there's nothing like it. Absolutely nothing like it. Yeah, that's um, man. It's just one of those things where, you know, I think I like the idea of the early season so much more than the real, than the actual thing. Yep. You know, getting out, you know, and just being out there hunting is great. And it feels so good to be back out there and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then like you're talking, you're battling low water, tons of pressure, hot temperatures, 
it's just like, you know, that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, I mean, there's not a lot of fun about that. I mean, yeah, it's better than not hunting, but, you know, it's still tough. And as you said, especially, you know, in areas like where we live, um, you know, once once the deer season starts kicking in, I mean, most people in our areas are focusing on that. Right. So you don't have as much hunting pressure from people, um, you know, in the waterfowl swamps and stuff. But And just to give, yeah, it's, I, I want to give some of the listeners an idea because, like, we'll say, you know, go out and scout and go out and check the birds and stuff. And, you know, we get reports from guys out of Louisiana and, and Texas that have these early seasons, and they'll go out and see you know, a couple hundred teal or, you know, all these mallards, you know, they're lining mallards up already, you know, green heads everywhere all over Facebook. We don't have that. Like there's a couple concentrations. There's some local birds here. Um, you know, we saw where we went had probably the most birds this side of the state, I'd probably say like there were birds everywhere, but I mean, I made a, a joke and not a, not a funny joke, but it sounded like we were in a, in a war zone when we were hunting. It was, it's nonstop. It's probably seven miles long. This swamp is, and it was the whole seven miles, pow, 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 you know, whole, the entire morning. And it, it literally, it sounded like a, a war was going on. So, I mean, that, that much of a concentration there, it's not like, you know, getting out in, what I assume Texas would be and maybe being, being able to hear some shots and still seeing hundreds of birds all day. Like that doesn't happen here. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't happen like that here much either unless, um, you know, we get a good diver push Mm -hmm. local, you know, wood ducks, mallards, you know, it's, we don't, we don't really get it like that here, unfortunately. So I, I definitely can relate to the struggle with that. But, um, with what you were saying about the shooting and the sky busting, when we start talking about the regulations a little bit, um, I'll be interested to get your take on one of the concepts that I think would be interesting to float and see, you know, if people would be receptive to it or not. Um, Cause you know, yeah, you can scout all you want when there's, you know, 25 guys lined up all around you, all just shooting at anything in the air, sky busting, whatever. Um, you know, you can throw your scouting out the window. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And that's kind of our idea with where we hunt is there's a trail on one side and railroad tracks on the other. And it's probably, I'd say six or 600 yards across, 700 yards across. So we get out in the middle because the guys shoot on the sides. They don't, you know, we, we carry a canoe, over three quarters of a mile back with all of our gear and then we go out. So, I mean, it's a, we grind, we grind hard to get out there and, and do it right. And we're out there early before anyone else is there. And, and, uh, you know, kind of, they start to funnel into the middle to get away from the shooting. So you try and work birds after that much shooting. They, they aren't, we just kind of, you know, quit on the calls cause they're not going to come. So any kind of motion we can get going in the water just for a, a safety factor is kind of how we go about it. But I mean, you look, you look over and you can see these, you know, Tweety birds and stuff. And I don't know if the guys don't know the difference or if there are birds maybe on the other side of the trees, but they're shooting at everything. And it is really, I mean, it's just, I don't know. There's nothing you can do. So you have, you know, a group of six birds coming in and then just, you know, 300 yards away. Pop, 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 pop. Well, then it's immediate 90 degree turn and they're, you know, headed the other way. So it's frustrating, but you know what you're getting into when you go into spots like that. So, and our, the place that we had a blind ready to go, it's been just bang out for us the last couple openers. Um, I think it was the end of July, we put a blind up and the water was probably down two feet from regular where it's at. And then we scouted it again and there's just a couple pockets of water. And I mean, it's <clears throat> normally it's about uh, right at the brink of the top of your chest waders deep in some of the runs. It's a, a beaver pond and I mean, mm-hmm. you're in ankle deep water. So, I mean, we're really hit hard by lack of rain this year and it just started raining recently, but that's because a, a hurricane came up through. So 
Right. But the next two weeks well, are dry and hot, and it's not going to help out. Well, hopefully you'll get some good natural vegetation growth with the water down, and if it floods up this you know later in the season, that's what I'm hoping for because it is there's ton of ton of food for them. So yeah, hopefully you get some ducks in there. Yes, sir. But all right, man. Well, let's um let's shift gears a little bit here, and um you know this the topic of the regulations kind of came up after well kind of this off season. And I think the one that really kind of jarred it loose for you locally was the idea of Pennsylvania authorizing the use of motorized decoys Mm -hmm. for the first time. Yep. You know, as we've talked about at length in this show, Pennsylvania has been one of the states that didn't allow them. So when that regulation came up, that was kind of big news locally. And then, you know, there were some other ones that kind of, you know, uh, shook the boat, rocked the boat in the waterfowl community. And I think probably the biggest one uh, that comes to mind is the pintail limit Mm -hmm. uh, reduction, particularly for guys in certain parts of the country. So, you know, we, we kind of talked a little bit about, Hey, this might be something good that we want to cover on the show. So we went to the listeners group and we kind of posed a question as to, you know, what, what, I can't remember if we said like, what, what regulations don't you like or what would you all like to see changed and why? Yeah, yeah. What yep. would you like to see changed and why? Um, that that was the question, and we got a lot of uh, a lot of interesting comments. And you know, I think it's probably worth saying, you know, because I think some of the things that we take at this are gonna, you know, some of the ways we approach some of these regulations and the discussion topics are gonna they're gonna be kind of coming from the same vein. I think, unfortunately, um, but I think the biggest thing to keep in mind, and we talked about this a little bit before we started recording tonight. Uh, you know, regulations are there to protect the resource, right? You know, they're there to protect waterfowl in the game that we're all pursuing. Um, they're not there to allow you to slaughter a limit of ducks every time you go out. Um, you know, and I think sometimes it at least seems like that gets lost on some people. Um, having said that, I, I, I'm sure that, that the folks that make these regulations are well aware. And I, I mean, I'm certainly uh, aware that, you know, you need to craft your regulations that protect the resource while enabling the hunters to have enjoyable, successful time in the outdoors mm-hmm. because you need those hunters buying licenses and buying duck stamps and all of those things to fund the conservation efforts and the, you know, all of those sort of things. So you need to strike that balance and, uh, most of the ones that we got that people were unhappy with, you know, they're the ones that probably everybody at some point has been unhappy with, you know, um, you know, shooting times, for example, was the bit was a huge one. You know, everybody's had it, you know, you don't see a duck all the afternoon and then five seconds after legal shooting light, here they come piling into your spot. Right. You know, um, we've all had that, but I think for the most part, we tried to stay away from, too much localized, you know, there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of guys that had issues with some of the local regulations for their particular spot, you know, or their particular state or whatever it is. And, you know, being that this goes out literally all over the world, we're not going to spend too much time talking about, you know, well, Arkansas does this or Missouri does that. And we're going to try to keep it a little bit bigger scope for that, from that regard, even though we're going to talk about, um, probably the first thing, uh, Pennsylvania and the motorized ducks. But that is something that's kind of a a greater theme because most places they're legal. Uh, I don't know how many other States are still illegal to use motorized ducks. Do you? Um, not many. I know that there's only five or so about the Sunday hunting, but, um, one of the first comments was Oregon has no motorized decoys. The one guy is totally, totally in love with it. Uh, Marquis is up in Maine, so he said that they, no, that was a Sunday hunting too. So I don't think there's too many left, honestly. Mm -hmm. And now. Yeah, so, I I mean, I I think that some of the laws are just, I think they're just outdated. And um, I don't know if it's a stubbornness or what it is, but, um, you know, you can use, 
the newest shotgun technology. You can use the new, the newest ammo technology, choke technology, calls, all of these things. And just, you know, we've said this a million times in the show, but just like when we had our interview with Sean Stahl, however long ago that was, you know, decoys are just a tool to get birds to do what you want them to do. It's not, it's not the end all be all calls. Aren't the end all be all, you know? So it's just one tool. And I mean, yeah, there's certain times when, uh, motorized spinning wing decoys and things can be effective, but anybody that's used a motorized decoy knows that you can't just stick it out there and just sit back and birds just literally fly into the decoy and, you know, bounce off it. Uh, it doesn't work like that. So I, I'm glad to see them come around on that. Um, I'd love to see Pennsylvania come around on, you know, sun, hunting on Sundays. Uh, but I, I don't know. The, that that seems like that fight's been going on since since I can remember. Yeah, there's. I'm just looking through some of the comments. And, you know, you said we're keeping it to a, a wider range. You know, we have some guys talking about uh, Arkansas, the WMA permit laws that passed. And I read into some of those a little bit and also cracked down on mud motors. Like, there's a lot that if we got into every state, South Dakota, you know, access laws on on the rivers and stuff. Like, there's a lot that we probably would be way off of our rocker even trying to talk about because we don't know those specifics so we'll keep it a high level and and go from there so talk a little bit about though the motorized spinning we you know did you see them like in every decoy spread this no so so what they did pass it but it does not go in effect until the next uh, meeting which could be six to eight weeks so they believe around thanksgiving will be when uh, motorized decoys... So season's practically over, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're pretty close. December 7th, so you're talking... We'll have two weeks and then yeah. another five days at the end of end of December. But on top of that, um, uh, I know it's not waterfowl, but even the, like, a scent dripper for um, archery hunting for whitetail, mm-hmm. that's, yeah. that's in the same boat, so... That's after our archery season is already out, so you can't. <laughs> so so that they're gonna legal, they're gonna legalize that. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the one of the things with the motorized decoys. Yeah. So, but um, yeah, I am pretty excited. I have a Lucky Duck HD with remote in my garage. It's charged up, and I have to wait another month and a half. So, um. Yeah, that's frustrating. I mean, what what's the deal? Why don't they just you know? It's been a it's been passed. Yeah, what's the story. They said it's been passed, but I wonder how many people got fined for it. This you know, to, oh, they're some, no doubt. they're legalized. Yeah, I can use it. Well, yeah, not it it. I guess it's not legal yet, but uh, yeah, everything got approved, but it'll be through around Thanksgiving is uh, is where we're at. But that I mean, honestly, I don't know. I don't know why, why can't you have them? Why did it take so long to do that? Why, you know, what is Oregon's reason for not allowing that? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand some of that stuff. Um, you know, so that, that, that's kind of the big one that's, that struck locally for us. Um, also the, you know, the other big one was the pintails, but for us uh, here in the Atlantic flyway, uh, the black duck limit going to two birds versus one was a nice, you know, a welcome bump for a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. Um, I certainly know that, uh, you know, guys in Jersey, New York, even down my way, you know, we get, uh, we get a a few black ducks and it's nice to, you know, have a little flexibility. If you get a knot of mallards come in and there's a couple black ducks in there, uh, you know, to, to be able to do better with that. So, um, you know, for the most part, uh, the the limits and, and things like that for us in the Atlantic Flyway and, you know, that's all I can really speak to with any kind of, uh, you know, legitimacy. Uh, the, the changes we've seen for the most part have been favorable as far as what kind of ducks we can kill most regularly. Uh, black ducks have gone up. Canvas backs have gone up. Uh, we have seen bluebills go down, but, you know, you can still you can take two bluebills um you know, which is, which is good. So, you know, in the late season duck time frame, when we've got 
ducks and we're not just hunting geese, you know, two black ducks, two canvas backs, um, you know, two blue bills plus your, uh, you know, your mallard limit. Um, you know, that's about what we see ring necks. You can shoot, you know, your full limit of those. We see some of them. Um, you know, but for the most part, we don't get a ton of pintails. We get some, not a, not a ton. Um, but yeah, I did find it interesting though, that they've already come out and said that they're going to change that law already for next season. So it looks like the pintail, um, you know, one, one duck limit is going to be kind of a short lived thing from what I've seen. Yeah. And we have, you know, we have a lot of people out in California in the Pacific flyway, which, you know, out there, and we kind of chatted about this before the we recorded too. You know, Pacific Flyway, a hundred and seven day season, and seven seven duck limit. So those guys, when they get into the early season, and they have they have all these pintails showing up. You know, they're really wondering. You know, why why is this happening? Well, you know, it has to come all the way across. You know, we I've I've killed one pintail my waterfowling career here in, in PA and um, you know, we just don't see them that much here. So if that has an effect on it, uh, I feel bad that California gets affected by that and those guys hunting those refuges out there. So, but like you said, short lived one season and um, they'll, they'll be back up to two. Yeah. So, you know, the, that that's one that I can see a lot of people getting pretty bent out of shape about, um, you know, another one, um, you know, the legal shooting times, I get it. Um, you know, the thing is a limit is, I look at a limit as, okay, if you're having a great day, we're going to stop you at this amount. A limit is not, Hey, uh, you know, we're going to set up our regulations so you can shoot this many ducks every time you hunt. So yeah, if they extended legal shooting time a little bit on each end, a lot more ducks would get killed and you'd have a better shot of reaching your limits. But for me personally, you know, I'm okay with it. Um, you know, I mean, it'd be nice, but, uh, for me, the bigger issue, um, and I know this one's kind of a localized thing for me, but I know there are similar laws, other places, um, when it comes to blind laws, um, well, hang on. That's, this is a bigger problem, I think. Bef- yeah, right. yeah. Before you get on to blind laws, because we had uh, Eric Hester, one of the guys in the in the group, said allow hunting until thirty minutes after sunset. And another guy right away, Matt Hoffman. I'm sorry, but I don't, I'm not sure where you're from. But he says, "Where do you live where this isn't a thing?" So, in our early season, in our uh, resident goose season. We we are allowed to shoot what is it 30, 30 minutes before sunrise to thirty minutes after sunrise in our in our early season. After 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 sun after, after, sunset. after sunset, correct. So correct. in our early season, but then once we get into regular season, it's no longer that way. In our our duck season it doesn't happen like that. So um like I said, Matt, I'm not sure where you're from, but um it's not a thing here during our duck season or our regular goose season, but it is in our, in our resident population season. But, um, yeah, I know I'm pretty sure Eric is from Colorado, so he's, he's feeling the same thing, but that's, again, that's a, a nuisance problem here. And we could talk on the nuisance season all day long in our area. Cause that's a, that's just a whole other issue, but we don't want to get too localized with this conversation. So, yeah, let's talk about your <laughs> let's talk about Virginia because we do have a lot of Virginia listeners and and the blind laws seem to be rather extensive. We do. And um you know so I I I want to touch on this law because one of the biggest things you hear about duck hunting as a whole is that one of the biggest problems we face is recruiting new hunters and retaining and you know retention of of current hunters. And you know, some people, when they do these surveys, you know, some of the things that come back is limited opportunities and you know, land access and all of these things. And, you know, in states that do it like Virginia, um, I mean, it, it makes it almost impossible to, to hunt if you're just a guy getting started. Uh, for anybody not familiar, in the state of Virginia, east of the, 19, east of the I-95 corridor, so basically 
all of the tributaries to the Chesapeake Bay, the big waterways that actually get good duck pushes during the migration. Um, you can legally lease a public piece of ground and put a private blind on it. So what that means is uh, if, you know, I want to go out into the Potomac River, I can, pr I can lease a private blind and build a private blind in public water that you as another hunter have to stay. You can't hunt with it within 500 yards of another legally licensed blind, whether I'm in there or not. So occupied or not, that blind is granted a 500 yard, no, no hunt zone from anybody else. Um, so what that effectively does is every landowner that owns land along the river uh, gets first rights to it so they can they can prevent you from hunting there then they could or they could build a blind and lease it to an outfitter or something like that so essentially um, you can't just ride out there and you're you know and walk out to the water and hunt um, you're pretty much forced to military bases public you know that that kind of thing that lease the blinds and then allow you to hunt them through a lottery or whatever they do um where I hunt locally, they allow you to float hunt so you can get your boat in a blind and, and go out and hunt within 400 yards of a legally licensed blind. But if you want to build a stationary one, it's within 500 yards. So as you can probably tell, not only are these really difficult for you to get access to hunt, they're incredibly confusing and they're so convoluted and it's incredibly frustrating. The guys that own property or own blinds that are licensed love this. And if I was them, I would love it too, because it, <laughs> it ensures that you're going to not have, you know, some, you know, jack wagon roll into your spread at shooting light, you know, paddling through with his canoe, trying to set up decoys a hundred yards away from you. Um, literally it's punishable by the law to do that. You know, you can't, you can't, you can't legally do it. But having said that, if you're a new guy and you're, or let's say you've moved from somewhere and you're an avid duck hunter and you just want to duck hunt here. Um, it's really hard to do and it, it makes it, it's unfortunate. And again, as I mentioned, in my opinion, regulations are in place to protect the resource while also allowing you to have a good experience in the field. I don't see how that level of restriction accomplishes that. Yeah. Oh. For landowners, I, I, I get it, <clears throat> but, um, I mean, 500 yards is a, it's a long ways. I mean, Name a public place where you can go, you know, a public land area where you can hunt and not have someone 500 yards within you. It's really hard to do. So how, how big, so, how big are the leases? They're annual, yearly. A yearly lease for, um, but acreage wise or like how far out into the, what, just 500 yards around, like how, can you put it on the other side of the bank? Like where, do you know those type of regulations? Yeah, there, there, there are, I mean, it's, it's, it's within certain feet of the, like the average low water mark and things like that. And it can't be more than, I want to say it's like 300 yards off the bank unless the channel is less than 300 yards and it can be like halfway. And, you know, all of these things that as a non, as, not, as a non blind owner, I don't right. necessarily have to deal with. Um, Do you know how much they but, are? Like how much to, uh, to lease? I don't know what a stationary blind costs. I want to say a floating blind license is like $40. So I think the fee is marginal. Um, you know, it's just really frustrating because landowners get the, 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 you know, they get the, the first right to lease the lease, the blind rights on the, for the, that are in front of their property essentially. So if they do that and never hunt it, and a bunch of people along the, the shore do it, you can't hunt essentially that stretch of the river. Right. When, you know, that's public water that they don't own. Right. I mean, they don't pay taxes on that river. Right. I mean, per se, you know, it's not their personal property, but they get to control it as if it was. So I can't legally hunt there. And while I respect that they have property on the water, they don't own the water intercoastal waterways are not owned by these people. So that that's a frustration of mine. And I, I mean, I, I, again, it's a, it's a have and have not situation. 
Right. You know, if I have it, I love it. If I don't, I hate it. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's hard. Yeah. And like you were saying, uh, for, but, for a new hunter to go out there and I mean, especially in Virginia where you're at, there's, you know, millions of people, a lot of people that have relocated from the country and really enjoy getting outdoors and hunting. And, you know, you have to drive an hour and a half, two hours to get somewhere where you might not even legally be allowed to be like that's a, right. and now these, these blind laws do not apply to the majority land wise of the state. It's just everything West of 95. It doesn't apply to everything East though. It does. And that's where a lot of, you know, that's all the water that, you know, dumps into the Chesapeake. So those are the large waterways. Um, and again, I, I, when I've hunted private blinds, I love it. It's, you know, you don't have the pressure. I mean, I mean, everyone can relate to the feeling of driving up to a public hunting area. And when you turn the corner and your headlights hit the parking lot, it's like, I get a knot in my stomach. It's Mm -hmm. like, how many cars are going to be here? Like, what am I dealing with today? It's like that anxiety to not have to worry about that is amazing. It's awesome. I mean, it's really great. And that's one of the reasons why I like hunting the military base, because you just know you got your blind, you go do your thing. No one's going to be on top of you, whatever. Uh, you know, if I own my own piece of property and I can ensure that, yeah, it's great. But again, if you're trying to recruit duck hunters and, uh, you know, get youth involved and stuff, you're pretty much forced to go to an outfitter, you know? I mean, you're, you're, and the thing that probably burns me up the most about it is the law applies whether the blinds being hunted or not. Right. So you could literally not be in there and. I mean, there's blinds that I've seen private blinds on the river that I've never seen someone sitting in ever, hmm. but I can't hunt in front of that within 500 yards of them ever. So I'm sure every area has laws similar to this, where if you're on the right side of it, you love it. If you're on the wrong side of it, you hate it. This is not a federal law, right? I mean, it's not a federally enforced, you know, migratory game bird law. It's a state thing. So it it's a little bit of a different, you know, it's kind of in that other bucket of, of regulations that we kind of go by, but it's one that has a really big impact on waterfowl hunters ability to waterfowl hunt. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just unfortunate because, you know, even if you can float hunt some of these areas with a boat, if you're getting into waterfowl, you don't have a boat that's safe enough to get out there and, you know, throw a decoy spread and do all these things. It's just not really possible. It's not feasible. So... I could see too where really limited. where if you had those blind laws of you know a, a 500 yards if no one's in it or 200 yards or 500 if someone's hunting it 200 if no one's in it well you know that every single person would be creeping up to that 200 yards until someone yells at them you know what I mean yep. like it would be a nonstop issue and I could see why they keep it well, either you know. 500 but then i mean people posted in the the listeners group too they posted a map and it looks like a checkered board all the way up the river like there's nowhere that you can be legally to hunt it's very it's very hard um you know and and i know for a fact that the way most well not most a lot of people lose their blinds because there's regulations about if a storm comes through or they have to be you know, brushed and huntable by like a certain date. Mm-hmm. And you've got guys that hawk those dates like crazy. And if a storm comes through and your blind gets knocked down, you better believe that they're on the clock. And if they miss that by one day, they'll lose it. Cause there's guys that are going to be calling that, that, that grid coordinate into the state yep. and, and taking it from you. I mean, I know there's outfitters in the river that I hunted have lost blinds because of that. Well, and, so, and going back to the, you know, new guys trying to hunt it, new guys and gals trying to hunt something like that. You know, if, if there was an opening like that, you know, you hunt out of a, a, a canoe and there's someone behind you in a war Eagle flying up the river and we'll get there, you know, an hour before you do. So, I mean, it's a, so for a new guy to go out there, they're not going to spend 20 grand on a, on a new boat to, you know, try and fight these guys that have been there and know the area that well. Mm-hmm. That is tough. Yeah. That sucks. So, yeah. It, it's hard, but again, it does make a more, a better hunting experience when you do get to hunt it. You know, you don't have guys like you're talking about raining BBs on you and stuff like that for the most part, mm. which 
I, I, I see a big benefit to that. You know, safety is, you know, a big thing. Um, you know, it's just one of those things, but it kind of, this kind of leads me to my other, my point that I wanted to sort of float by you. I know that there's certain management areas in, in various States and stuff where they only allow you to take a certain number of shells to the blind with you mm-hmm. on any given day that you hunt. Yep. What would you say if just because it's easier to relate to the, the state of Pennsylvania passed a law that said, as a waterfowl hunter, you cannot go to the blind with more than 15 shells for your firearm per, per man. Just throwing that number out. I just picked it out of thin air. But what would you say if they limited the number of shells to prevent careless shooting, sky busting, things of that nature? Me personally, I think that would be awesome. One, because I'm an expert at the minimalist challenge now. But secondly... <laughs> people would be more careful. They would actually try and decoy birds. Um, and like you said, they wouldn't be sky busting. They wouldn't be, they wouldn't be rattling through shells every time a, a Tweety bird flies by like that's And that is, you know, some of the regulations here around Pima tuning, if you get in some of the blinds there, um, I think, and I'm trying to think that when it turns to a three bird limit, I think you're only allowed to have 10 shells. I'm pretty sure. Hmm. So, yeah. so there you got three geese, <laughs> three geese you can shoot. You got 10, 10 opportunities. So are you going to be shooting at those birds that are banking at 60 yards? Probably not. I don't know. Right. I, and then think about this, you know, if you've got 15 shells and you've shot, you know, let's say you've killed two or three birds and you've, um, you know, you knock one down, let's say it takes you, three or four shots to kill those and then you knock one down and it's a cripple and you got to follow up on it like once or twice if you're diver hunting or something like that you know you got two more birds or three more birds you can kill and you've got a handful of shells left you know you're going to be more selective um i mean the the major drawback that comes to my mind pretty much immediately is the fact that you know if you did have crippled birds you know as you as your shell you know limit expired yeah, that kind of puts you in a tough spot. I don't know how that works ethically, but, um, again, I I think that obviously the, the shell limit is, is imposed in certain areas and in certain management areas regulate, you know, that regulate these things. I, I, I for one would be for it. I I think it would be, uh, it would be a step in the right direction to incentivize people to, to shoot more carefully, try to work birds a little more, and uh, would prevent the whole sky busting. Yeah, it would make you know, it thing that, that everybody it would knows is a big issue. It would make it more sporting, without a doubt. And you, I could see people saying, "Well, you know, my kid's not that good of a shot. Well, maybe spend a little more time at the range, and then you know, teach your kid how to take ethical shots." And it's funny because you know, Trav and I were out there and literally in this small pothole that we're trying to get birds in a perfect spot to where we can land it in this little, little bit of water or within, you know, 20, 20 yards of us. And there's birds that we would usually shoot at. And he's like, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to shoot, I'm going to shoot. And I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. And he's like, uh, like, (laughs) and just watch him fly away. So it's like, you know, we, we were restraining ourselves just because we knew what we were up against and ethically it, it wasn't the right thing to do. But then, you know, these birds fly over the railroad tracks and there's guys, I mean, you know, they're above treetops and just pow, 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 pow. And it's just like, ah, uh, like, mm-hmm. you know, what are... Yeah, and, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be for that if, you know, uh, we were in a day where most people are hunting ducks to put the, you know, to feed their families. Obviously, you know, guys are eating ducks and that kind of thing. But, I mean, there's probably not many guys out there that are sustaining their family on ducks alone. No. Right? I mean, that's probably a safe assumption i'm sure there are some that tried to do it the best they can so they're probably not in favor of having their their shells limited and that kind of thing but i mean i think more of an issue today is the whole social media uh, you know i want to thump my chest because i got big piles of birds and all this other crap that you see on the internet um you know to get back to your point about kids and stuff heaven forbid we teach a kid to to cherish and respect killing a single bird let alone, 
you know, having to feel disappointed if he didn't kill a limit or, you know, didn't shoot all these birds or you missed a couple times, you know, who, who freaking cares? You know what I mean? Like, I think that's a, that's at least for me, that's not what waterfowl hunting is about. I don't want to speak for everybody, but for me personally, if I go out and I, you know, if my kid misses 14 times and on that 15th shell connects and drops a, a, you know, a mallard in the, in the decoys or whatever, we will celebrate that just as much as if he killed six ducks. Right. I can promise you that. Yeah. And I could see like, you so, know, obviously like a snow goose season, you'd be a lot of more shells, something like that. But of course. I think if you're, <laughs> it'd be tough too. Cause if you have uh you know, a high limit of mergansers or high limit of coots and, and people are out there and racking them up, you know, they're going to want more than, than 15, 15 shots at that, especially coot limits 15. So, or 30 sometimes depending where you're at. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think that will ever happen, but I think it would be an interesting concept that, you know, I could probably get behind, frankly. Yeah, for but, sure. Um, and I love the, the guy that messaged me and said he tried the minimalist challenge, you know, two decoys, a box of shells, went out, limited out, just, you know, crushing them. It's just perfect. So it's cool. Challenge yourself to do it. Challenge yourself not to take shots out outside 30 yards, you know, get them nice and tight and and enjoy that part of the, the sporting side of it. If I if 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 some of the places I hunt, I had to wait till birds get inside thirty yards, I would <laughs> I would not pull the trigger all day. Ever, just the fact that yeah, because every blind they fly by at forty yards, they get shot at. Right, they <laughs> know they know better. Some don't <laughs> <laughs> they know better? Heck yeah, they know. I mean, they're not dumb. They don't just. Very few of these birds just come. Oh, look! Every five hundred yards, there's a big stack of decoys in front of a box blind. <laughs> this is the one I'm going to go die in yeah. today. You know, it's it doesn't. It's not like that, but. There's definitely situations, you know, I've always liked the videos watching guys bow hunt them and stuff like that. I think that's kind of cool. But, All right. So, so I'll, I'll throw an, a, a new one out and it was brought up. Uh, the contradiction of going out and having to shoot geese in a cut cornfield with steel in the morning and in afternoon you're allowed to use lead for doves. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, I thought that was a great point and I mean, never really crossed my mind before. I just Well, and I mean, to that end, you know, if you're hunting on dry ground, what does it matter if you're, you know, if you're hunting in a field and you can shoot doves with lead in that field, why can't you shoot ducks and geese? Both. Right. And I know, with, I mean, it's, with lead. it's tough and they're obviously not, you know, they're feeding on corn in a cut corn field. I totally understand. Or even a, a grain field. I could see where the lead might get mixed in a little bit. I, how does, I don't know. Do the, do the doves not, are they not affected by lead poisoning? How is that still allowed then? Well, I think, I mean, wasn't the issue that the, the, um, for the ducks, it's the lead in the water, and then the ducks were eating it. Correct, right? That's what that's what we were. That's why. Um. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they just don't <laughs> care about ducks. <laughs> Dove, <laughs> doves as much. <laughs> Dove, doves' lives matter. No, but I'll tell you what. We have a we have had a. Um, I think they just found the seventh dead bald eagle. Um, in Pennsylvania from lead poisoning and what they're, they're saying, there's, you know, this big thing going around, you know, if you shoot groundhogs, make sure you stuff them back down in the hole, make sure that Eagles can't yeah. get to it. Yeah. You've seen it too. So I, for one, uh, we have, uh, just probably six or seven Eagles that are always around my house now. So I literally will shoot groundhogs and make a Eagle buffet is what I call it. Like I'll lay them out and I'll take pictures of them not far off the road, like right across in the field across my house. And, you know, I haven't had one time. I don't think where one of my rounds has stayed inside the groundhog. I don't know what kind of rifle you're using, to where it stays inside yeah. but but i think what they're finding mostly is um 
it it almost seems like lead sinkers, some kind of, I mean, it could be mistaken as a, as a BB, a lead, I don't know, but um, they're finding little specks inside these eagles. So there's a, there's a big mm. push. Obviously I don't want to see eagles dying from lead poisoning or any other animal. I'm sure that's not a fun death, but um, yeah, just another, another thing you have to be careful for. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I've never hunted, you know, I can remember hearing stories of, you know, folks that are older talking about hunting ducks with lead. I've never done it. Don't really bother, doesn't bother me any. Um, I don't really dove hunt. I don't really small game hunt that much. So it's not like I'm, you know, buying a bunch of one of both kinds for guys that are, that sucks. But, um, you know, yeah, I don't have a good answer for that one. Yeah, it's a tough know. one. I'd like to, I'd like to hear the reasoning for that, or see if there's mm-hmm. something that could be changed. Because I mean, <clears throat> you know, talking to the old timers when they did use lead for waterfowl, like there's a there's quite a big difference in the the knockdown power between the two. So, mm-hmm. and and that's one thing too. Like we don't get we don't get a lot of ducks in dry fields around here. I don't know if you do down there, but. Um, no you know it's just not that prevalent here but that's a that was a great point brought up yeah you know and i think too i think so often we focus on the ways that the the regulations restrict what we want to do and what we can do um but we kind of overlook sometimes the way that the restrictions have changed to make it better for us um you know just to kind of rattle off a few here in the last couple years possession limits have changed from two to three days. Uh, so you don't, you know, you don't have that optical running into as much, um, early teal seasons. You're starting to see those become more prevalent. You know, more States are willing to, you know, open that up and give guys a chance to hunt, you know, teal early. The snow goose conservation seasons are, you know, expounding like crazy. Um, you know, so more guys are getting opportunities to to hunt longer and, and take more birds and, you know, this, that kind of leads me into one of my next questions, and we've talked about this. That you know, a lot of the studies show that hunters' impact on the on the po- on the population doesn't have a significant effect one way or the other on uh, you know uh, population levels and things like that. So I find it funny that you know, I mean, I can't speak for every flyway, but for us, for example, we can shoot four mallards in our duck limit, but only two, no more than two hens. Um, but you know, like wood ducks, we can shoot three wood ducks. Doesn't matter. Uh, you know, one or the other. So I'm just, you know, I know there's some people out there that don't shoot Susie's at all. Only green heads and you know, that kind of thing. Other guys don't care. They shoot whatever they get. Um, you know, so I mean, how do you feel about it? Does it kind of, does does stuff like that have a negative impact on you or, uh, you know, do you have any issues with those kind of regulations? That's going to, you know, back again to where our, we don't have the ducks like the other flyways do. So, um, but let's use, uh, let's use wood ducks for example, example, cause you shoot wood ducks yeah. and they're really, see, you know, you've, you've been on some, what if you could, of your three wood ducks, only two could be drakes and you had to, you had to pick out a third. Uh, on, you know, only one two. could be a female. Yeah. One hen and two drakes. Yeah. Yeah, I would be bothered by it. <laughs> That's, I mean, the, the simple answer, and and that goes back to you know why. I don't know. I there's there's so many unanswered questions. We I feel like we need to get Devney on here again just to to help us out with some of these. But yeah, there's um, yeah, he'd be a good one to have. <clears throat> yeah, the uh, I I don't know. It's like why, but then they say that it doesn't have that much of a an impact. So if it doesn't have an impact, why, you know, why can't we shoot for hen mallards? It's a great question. Right. Well, and I think it's funny because, um, (laughs) I'm not going, I'm not going to go, we're not turning this into a political discussion, but with many things in life, including waterfowl hunting, I just speaking personally for myself am all about, regulations and policies that make things better for 
everything, right? So if 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 only taking two hens in your mouth limit makes sense and that that improves populations and things like that, awesome. I'm I'm for it. But where's the statistical evidence in the research that that bears that out? You know what I mean? Where do where do these come from? You know, okay, did someone just say, well, you can shoot four mallards, but eh, let's just make sure it's not four hens. Let's just back it off to like you know half. Is that an arbitrary number that someone just picked out of a thin air, or is there scientific research to back that that's that's a number that should be for whatever reason? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, if they said, hey. You know, the wood duck population would be infinitely stronger if we only killed one hen out of our three things. And here's the data to show that. Okay, cool. I'll do my, you know, it is, it is what it is. Um, I, I don't think that that exists personally. Um, and frankly, like we've talked about, I think it bears the quite the, the exact opposite. So I just don't know where these limits on things like that come from. And, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you make a mistake and you accidentally harvest one, you know, you got to pay the piper for that when, you know, it might be just the regulation that for, that doesn't really bear out what it, you know, what you think it might be intended to, to accomplish or whatever. Right. You know what I'm saying? And the, I mean, the hunting has to have an impact or else bluebills wouldn't be going back down to two and pintails wouldn't be at one. And then immediately jumping back up to two, like either someone's pulling strings just to see if they have the power to do it or, hunting actually does have an impact on it well i think the pintail is a is is a a great example to to get an idea of of if hunter impact does or not um you know they changed that before a single duck was harvested on that one duck limit right you know before seasons were even open they changed it again so you know what is it are they basing these you know and they're basing they're they're now setting season limits and and stuff a year in advance they used to wait for the harvest statistics to come out Mm -hmm. before they set those they don't anymore they they use the aerial surveys and all that kind of stuff to forecast forward so you know where what what data are they using and do hunter numbers really make an impact see now and on the on the flip side of this i could see where because canvas backs are up to two right yeah. So I could see where they say canvasbacks are two drakes, like there are two bulls. Like I could, I could see where that could come into effect. Cause when we were down there hunting, you know, you'd have 70 birds come in and two were hens. Well, when they say, you know, they, they are actually breeding the females to death. Like there's so, there's such a, um, yeah, they're going after them balance, just, in, in balance. Yeah, yeah. And then I could see where they well even bump it up to three, but they're all drakes. You know, I could see where mm-hmm. that something like that would come into effect because we've seen it. I don't know if if they've seen something like that with pintails. I, you know, I can't say that. Um, and same with bluebills. Like, why are they? Why do they keep bouncing around? And you know, black ducks. They must be coming back to bump that. Uh, that's the first time in. In three decades, I believe that it's been more than one. So right. they must be making a, a comeback. So there has to be some kind of evidence that we're not hearing about, not being able to read about. Um, I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe that's or, our... I mean, or it could be just simply like, you know, they're looking at a combination of things. They're saying, okay, maybe the habitat conditions where this, these particular species tend to do most of their... Uh, their breeding and, and nesting has been poor. So knowing that we want to give them a break on their wintering grounds and their way there and, and back the limit off a little bit. Um, you know, it, it could be something like that. It could be a mm-hmm. combination of things, or it could be just a situation where they're not sure why it's declining. And maybe they want to try to buy time to figure it out, to make sure that, you know, because I, I think most people would, would probably, you know, want to err on the side of caution. And if you say I have to kill one less duck of this particular species because you need to figure some stuff out about what's going on with them, I'm okay with that. Right. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, I don't want to annihilate an entire species or subspecies or whatever. Um, but at the same time, you know, we all pay money to hunt, right? I mean, it's a it's a heavily regulated very expensive thing to do and i do don't think we should just be regulated just for the sake of being regulated so 
as long as it's in good nature and well founded, I'm for it. But you know, I think that there's probably some education that could go around uh, that would help. I mean, I think one, another big one that comes up a lot are season dates. Mm-hmm. You know, so we all know federal framework is set up, and then your state, you know, sets the dates within that framework. Well, I think you can speak quite well to this. You know, you don't see many ducks in your duck seasons. They're they're no. after you, and you know, so your season closes like essentially in December, you get like five days after Christmas or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm essentially one state to the South of you more or less. And I can hunt dun- ducks until the last Saturday in January. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, and it's, it's like, so yeah, they get to pass you, but when they get to me, <laughs> which, you know, I don't know, a lot of them probably don't go further than, than us. You know what I mean? I mean, some of them probably go down to the Carolinas, but I, I think a lot of the Eastern or Atlantic flyway birds tend to stop New York, Maryland, Delaware ish, Virginia ish kind of thing. Um, yeah, I don't know the ones that, the ones that stay on this, this, you know, that don't go towards Louisiana and, you know, peel off onto that one. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, a whole other subject too. Like the Atlantic and Mississippi flyway have 60 day duck seasons the central flyway has 74 pacific flyway has 107 days so if you're looking at pennsylvania you're thinking that again i don't know if it goes to hunter recruitment let's get the the elderly and the youngins out in october november and you know get them back into it but yeah from october 7th to december 9th is ours and then it comes back in december 26th through the 30th so that's our duck season and i mean that goes back to you gave me a hard time for a while about you know not having a diver spread but really you know you get a lot of your divers coming down you know not the coast but it's on the eastern side of pennsylvania into virginia where we don't get those divers until mid-january and we're already you know we're two weeks out of season already, three weeks. But lately, the last two years, we have had pushes, and that is what caused me to uh, acquire some diver decoys this year. But it's tough when you well, here, when you have those sixty here's, days. Here's a question. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think there's anything like so for Virginia. We have four days of duck hunting in October. Then we're shut down until mid-November. We get two weeks. Then we're shut down again until after Thanksgiving and then it's pretty much um maybe no we're shut down until like mid December and then it's basically December through end of January mm-hmm. and so they backload all of our time yours you have like the whole month of October and some change do you think that Pennsylvania does that because they assume that in January most of your water is going to be froze up that's what and birds are just going to continue on anyways that there is that their argument that's the that's about the only thing i can think it would be is that the birds are going to pass right over they go out on the eastern side of the state and fly down um but yeah i mean i want to be out there when it's cold and you know we get those cold fronts coming in and the pushes of migrators come through here but you know it just it doesn't happen like that so you know now we're october 9th today i think and the next two weeks are in the 60s and 70s, no no colder than 50s at night. Like, that's not duck season to me. I don't like it. Huh. Yeah. Not at all. I don't enjoy that either. So even, I mean, why would you not split it up? Even have, you know, some uh, a couple good woody shoots in the beginning of October and then stop it till November. But then going back to the same thing, I think Pennsylvania messes up the archery season too. Like, we're done in archery before the rut even begins. So what's the reasoning there? Like November 11th is the last day this year. And that's, you know, that's right when it's really kicking in beginning of November through end of November. So I don't know. Here's a lot of season dates, but, uh, you know, a lot of guys go to the symposiums and there's no, you know, they don't, they listen a little bit, but not, not enough to change something like that. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know. Um, well, I, I think the deer season is a completely different ball game for you guys out there because of the number of hunters you have. Right. Um, you know, 
unlike a lot of places, you guys don't have a muzzle litter season per se. Um, so like down here, it was we, a late you know, in a lot of places, late muzzle loader. Well, yeah, but we have like. I feel bad because we said we're not going to stay get localized with this crap, and then we've talked about nothing but Virginia and Pennsylvania. <laughs> but um, I know that, like for here, you can archery hunt through mid November. Well, actually, the season technically ends uh, like the second Saturday or second Sunday of, of November, but the muzzleloader season comes in November first. So, no- muzzleloader and archery run concurrently for two weeks, and then muzzleloader continues on through i don't know a period of time um so you can still bow hunt while that and then firearm season starts right after that so you can bow hunt through that if you want to or you can gun hunt so you know if you guys had guns during the rut in the woods i mean you would pummel the deer population right well then i mean so literally i, I could drive part of it. i could drive eight miles west and be in ohio god we're talking about archery again but their archery season opens, it opened the same date this year as we did, and it runs through February. They can be out archery hunting. Yeah, that's how ours is, too. I mean, that's, why Why wouldn't you do that? I mean, that, I think that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> because we stopped November 11th. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, so, again, um, I think that they, you know, yeah. I don't know. So here we go but, to the to the next uh, ultimate question, which you've had a a reversal of lately. But Sunday hunting. Yep. Yep. Um. So you've seen both sides I, of that. What do you? Let me let me hear your take on it. I love it. I mean, I I love it. It, it for a guy like me. Uh, you know, I coach my son's baseball team, so every Saturday morning I'm not duck hunting or. Um, you know, goose hunting, um, coaching baseball. So Sundays I get to go out and hunt. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't get to hunt hardly at all, uh, when baseball season's going. And, you know, it's not, it's only on, um, it's weird. Like you can't hunt big game deer or anything like that on public ground on Sundays, but you can waterfowl hunt on public ground on Sundays. So, you can hunt the military bases and all that kind of stuff. Now the trade-off is the seasons have been condensed because they have to count for Sundays now. Right. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't care because those are usable days. You know what I mean? You can extend it all you want Monday through Friday. I don't get to use those days that much. So the more sat, the more weekends we can get exposure to the better. Plus, you know, when, like when we're talking about, Hey, you know, why don't you come down and hunt with me? You can come down and get, a full weekend of hunting in before you have to go home. If I come up to Pennsylvania to hunt and I leave Friday after work, I hunt one day, one morning essentially. Right. And I'm done. So if I'm coming from out of state and I want to buy a three day license, there's not three days in consecutive. You can hunt for a weekend. No. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's unfortunate. And you know, I'm, I'm not big on regulations like that for private property at all. Um, As far as I'm concerned, if you own that property, you should be able to do what you want to do. Um, I believe Virginia is like this. I know I'm pretty sure West Virginia is like this as well. If you're a landowner in the state, you don't have to buy a hunting license to hunt your own private property. You and your immediate family do not have to buy a hunting license. You still have to follow the regulations and you have to buy deer tags and stuff like that. So you can't kill in excess of the limit, but we all pay like a, I don't know, 26 bucks or whatever it is for a state hunting license on top of your archery tag and your duck stamp and all that other stuff you get. If you're a landowner and you're hunting your private property, you don't have to pay the state to hunt just a statewide resident tag. You know what I'm saying? Makes sense. Which I think is, I mean, it it makes total sense. It's your land. You know what I mean? You're, you pay the state property tax for that. You shouldn't have to pay them anything else to do anything else on it. And go any day of the week you want. Yeah. Going to West Virginia too. They're, there's only certain counties where you can hunt on Sundays in West Virginia. Right. Right. So what's, I don't. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's only like three or four states left that still do that. And I mean, I'm just shocked that it's taken this long, but you know, for, for a state like Pennsylvania, it, it baffles me in any state, particularly that is a, t- that has a, a pretty robust, uh, 
outdoor industry Mm -hmm. where people hunt and spend a lot of money in the outdoors, you want to get people in the field spending money on clothes and camo and guns and licenses and all that kind of stuff. Hotels. Give them more opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, Like give them more opportunities to do it. You know what I mean? All those diners that the hunters go to at lunchtime, you don't think they're going to, they don't want Sunday hunting. I mean, give me a break. You know, yeah, there's going to be a lot of guys that won't do it. They won't hunt on Sundays because of whatever. Maybe, you know, they got church or they got family or whatever it is. That's cool. But give them the choice. You know what I mean? Right. That, that's just something that I don't I don't understand. And even if they start like in Pennsylvania or in Virginia where they haven't allowed it on private ground, it's still a step in the right direction. Yep. Or I'm sorry, public ground. It's still, it's still a step in the right direction. Yeah. And, you know, the biggest argument is, well... Would you be okay with, say, giving up a Wednesday? Yes. Would you be okay with course, with, ter- with pushing the season question. back? I mean, yes. Like, <laughs> I would much rather have both of those. I would rather have Sunday hunting. I'd rather, you know, and, man, it's tough. It, it's... But again, I don't. I don't know. Does that come to a a want and need? Do you need it? I guess I don't need it. I've went this whole time without it. But yeah, I want it. I think we should have the the option to to take it. Well, the reality of it too is, anybody out there that has kids can relate to this. Kids are the most are the busiest people in the world. Mm-hmm. Like you think, you know, you as a businessman or whatever is are busy. Kids, you know. On top of going to school every day, you know, all day, whatever, you know, I got my kid in baseball and scouts and all this other crap that we got going on. I mean, it's go, go, go constantly. And he goes to bed at like 7.30, 8 o'clock, right? I stay up later to get the rest of the crap that I got to do done. If I'm being able to hunt Sundays gets me an opportunity to get him out in the field and spend some time with me and expose him to that kind of stuff, that's the kind of opportunities that they should be looking at because he's going to be the one that's going to be buying the licenses and doing all these things next. And if they don't allow these kids the opportunity to get out there and do that, they're going to miss out. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I, I, I firmly believe to some extent that's why when we were growing up and I, I assume it's still this way, but I don't know for sure. You know, we had the first day of deer season, buck and doe, because they were separate at the time. We had the first day of buck season off of school and we had the first day of doe season off of school mm-hmm. because they know Nobody would be going to school. That That's day. a state holiday, We're all man. Behind with our families. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just it's just the way it is. Um, you know, open up Sundays. Maybe you don't have to do that as much. That kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah, it's baffling. It is bad. It, it just seems like there's so many more positives than negatives. And you know, you do have all the people that the Farm Bureau and stuff that oh, we won't allow it on my farm and you know a lot of a lot of people are against it and i don't know like you said but just no, the, there, that's the thing there's no one saying that you have to let people hunt your farm on sundays nope you could just say i don't want it on sundays that's just you know my day okay cool and that that comes to another <laughs> another issue too is just the the trespassing laws in pennsylvania like they are so bad you can post it or put a sign saying no sunday hunting and those guys still have to regulate it or I'd, you know, if it was, you know, public hunting only or private hunting only, like I'd still be thinking that people are sneaking on just because there's no, there's no enforcement of trespassing in Pennsylvania, not like Ohio or, or anywhere else. Like it's a joke. Well, I think, I think unfortunately too, you know, conservation offices is in general, you know, are tightly budgeted and never have enough guys to really adequately enforce game regulations and that kind of thing. Right. Um, That's a, you know, that's going to be a tough putt. It would be nice to see some, some teeth to those types of laws wherever they are, because so that, you know, you could get not game wardens, you know, you could get state police or whoever involved in the enforcement of that kind of stuff. And the, the thing of it is though, if you could prove that they were like doing some sort of drug situation or something like that on your property, it'd probably be a completely different story. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. It's like, you know, these laws we care about these ones because it doesn't impact anybody else. and only screws you as a private landowner guy. Nah, eh, not as big of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a bummer in that regard. I'm just looking through these questions, see if there's anything else, uh, 
the one the one guy mentions that he likes how some states like New York re- require you to pass a bird identification course. I don't think. Yeah. Oof. That's a tough putt. <laughs> I think I think it'd be helpful. But again, I mean, if well, it, I mean, I how does what's what's the test? Look at a book and identify it. Maybe I don't think a lot of people would pass it. Okay. There'd be a lot well, a lot of people I failing. When people would pass. A lot of people would pass would pass that that wouldn't pass a duck flying by them in a blind. Yeah, before they pulled the trigger, I tell you that for sure. <laughs> oh man! But you know, I mean, we can regulate things to death if we want to. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. A couple of guys. At the end of the day. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna. I was just gonna say a couple of guys brought up the the point system that used to be in effect, which I think is pretty cool, but I think is unnecessary just because you know 95 percent of the birds are above their long-term average so you know the dime ducks you know going out and each duck is allotted you know 10 or 20 or or 40 or whatever you're at once you hit 100 points then you're done for the day so you know if teal were 10 points you could shoot 10 teal a day um you know i think pintails were 100 so if you shot one pintail you're done um, I think, uh, mallard hens were 40 and the drakes were 20. So you could shoot two hens and one drake that would get you to a hundred. I think there's more math issues involved with that than what it would be worth. And like I said, yeah. I think the birds are doing really well right now. So that's, that, that just seems to me like, uh, you know, we have so much more research about each individual species, you know, species and and type of duck. Um, I just don't think that, you know, a general point system is even necessary. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Look at each and each individual duck on their own and set a limit for that, that particular type, because, you know, as we've mentioned, I'm really concerned about four or five types of ducks when I hunt, because that's about all I see mm-hmm. ever. You know, so if I shoot a redhead or a couple of redheads, cool, but I don't see them that often to really worry about, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I'd be bummed out if, you know, I'm sitting on a killer, uh, you know, spot that's got a bunch of bluebills and, um, you know, ringnecks hitting it and I shoot a canvas back first flight and I got to pack up for the day because mm-hmm. I saw, you know, the, the unicorn canvas back come in and I dumped it and I'm like, eh, there's one, you know, I mean, that's cool, but it, you know, kind of, you know, boogers it up to some degree, but you know, It'd be tough. That's pretty much all I had as far as regulations goes. Um, you know, I think the only thing I'll just say kind of imparting on that is just, you know, we got to keep in mind a little bit as, uh, you know, what what the regulations are for and what they're they're meant to accomplish. And, you know, yeah, they're not, they're not there to enable us to shoot limits, unfortunately. Uh, so... Although some of them we don't like, I think they do serve their purpose. Others, you know, you'll probably get someone to argue with you till the end of time based on some of these and depending on what side of the fence they're on. But, um, you know, I, I think the hardest thing about these two is some of these are, I mean, as you've mentioned, they're hard to change, you know, yeah. particularly when you're just, you know, it seems like it's almost even harder at the local levels to get them to change. You know, I mean, it seems like at the federal level, they swing on duck limits and things of that nature kind of with some regularity. Right. Um, the local, the local re- regulations and things are the ones that seem to be so, so much more entrenched. And, and I don't know if that's just because there's like a lack of knowledge at the local level. I mean, that's a complete guess, completely unfounded. You know, I mean, I have no idea. Yeah, it might be. But, it might be because they hear more voices from from the local people or they have more of an impact, you know what I mean? Than the overall federal government when they, when they go to that, yeah, they could hear it right in their backyard and have people super mad at them that know them personally where, you know, well, and that's the thing too, to keep in mind at the, at the federal level, they're literally managing like an international resource, right? You know, this is a bird that is crossing, you know, country boundaries and things like that. So, it's not as politicized as it would be locally, you know, as, you know, for example, like the Sunday hunting argument, some of these places, um, 
So it's a completely different ball of wax. And, uh, you know, hopefully with the retention issues and the recruitment issues and stuff, you know, you got the, the guys like Devney and, you know, Delta and, and everybody out there kind of fighting the good fight for us. So hopefully, um, you know, anybody that's not a member of Delta waterfowl, um, I would encourage you to listen to our episodes. And when we've had John Devney from Delta on the show, uh, listen to that guy and walk away from those episodes and try to tell me that, you know, he's not passionate about waterfowl and, um, you know, preserving hunters interests and pushing, um, a conservationist approach to waterfowl hunting mm-hmm. uh, at, the, at all levels to including Capitol Hill and DC. So, um, if you're not a member of Delta waterfowl, I'm not saying that Ducks Unlimited or Waterfall USA or anything others are not great organizations and do, and do great work because they do. But for me personally, Delta Waterfowl is is the one that focuses more on hunter um, hunter access. They were instrumental in getting um, Sunday hunting legalized in Virginia. They take on hunting related issues where Delta uh, Ducks Unlimited, for example, tend to stay strictly on the conservation side of the house for the most part, Mm -hmm. at least from what I've seen. If I'm wrong with that, people can correct me, but Delta will get involved in hunter right access issues, things of that nature. So for me, that's the organization. I mean, I support them. I support several of them, but Delta is the one that I'm, that I track the most and follow kind of what's going on with those guys. They are the front line and, and John is, he's the spearhead of all that. and And just, so much knowledge. I love talking to him and, um, you know, we, we do have him lined up whenever we need him. So I think we'll have him on here yeah, soon I mean, again. That, and that, that tells me all I need to know about the organization. I mean, he's, you know, literally down in DC representing Delta waterfowl and we have essentially an open line with him. Anytime we want him on the show, he will come and do it and talk about whatever we want to. So just that right there speaks kind of to their larger mission and their larger posture on the whole deal is, you know, they want to talk to hunters and they want to be involved with the hunting community as well as protect ducks and, you know, the science and the research that goes into that. Yep. I messaged him and say, Hey, kind of want to put you on a hot seat. And he said, let me know. And I mean, doesn't want any (laughs) questions prior. Like the guy's just, he's, he's, he's fighting a good fight. That's, that's all you can say about it. So, well, what's, uh, I know we're over an hour and a half here, but what's um, what's your baseball season looking like, and when are you going to be out and about getting after these birds? So, uh, you know, next next Saturday, um, actually, by the time this episode releases, the baseball season will be over. So we've got two more games right now. But as I mentioned, our waterfall season is out until mid-November. Hmm. So um, I'll be getting the bow out and probably trying to stick a dough or two for the freezer and, um, you know, see what I can get into there and then just seeing what shows up with the, you know, the birds. It's, it's hard for me to say right now, man. I I tell you, my, my motivation is not real high right now. Um, it's just a combination of a lot of things going on. Right. You know, and it's, uh, it's just hard to get fired up. I mean, it just is what it is. So, um, I'm, I'm like a lot of you guys out there when I got a hunt, I'm I'm up super early. I'm driving an hour each way to get at least to get where I'm going. Uh, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort in, in 80 degree weather. I'm just not into it. So hopefully we get some colder weather and I don't know. Yeah. And that's a day by day at this point, but that's a tough one too. Like with this hot weather, usually it's getting colder and, and guys stop fishing. So our lakes right now, you drive by them and there's, you know, boats galore. And that's, that's something that I've, (laughs) well, that's something I've always tried to, you know, just kind of respect when, when they can do their thing, like let them, let them be out there and do that. And then once it gets too cold and, you know, hit up the local lakes and, and go after them. But like you said, the weather's, the weather's hot, our water's low and you know, there's some birds around, but they're, the access is tough. So, so we'll keep on them and hopefully find them here shortly. Yeah. Well, I think before we close out the show, um, 
you know, it's, I, I know a lot of people <laughs> beat us up about the, the show release regularity. And I think Dan and I, and I have kind of talked about trying to do at least monthly episodes. And I think, I think I speak for both of us, Dan kind of saying that that's sort of our commitment right now. And, you know, we'll do the best that we can with it. Um, so I apologize. It was, well, you know, 79 days or whatever it was since the last episode. But, um, you know, we appreciate everybody kind of hanging with us and, um, you know, it, 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 it does astound me sometimes that I watch the download numbers, even if we haven't put out an episode in a month and a half, still continue to grow. The listener group still is continuing to grow. So what that's telling me is that there's a lot of new people coming to the show and are benefiting from, you know, the catalog of episodes that we have, which is awesome. So, you know, to anybody that's new to the show, that's recently kind of, you know, found us out, you know, welcome. We appreciate you guys. And to everybody that's been around uh, for the long haul, you know, obviously we appreciate you guys too and, and bearing with us. And, um, you know, we know that a lot of guys out there put a lot of time on, you know, behind the steering wheel or at work and, or at the desk at work or whatever it is. And, you know, just like us, you know, you guys hang on to whatever you can to kind of get you through Monday to Friday and kind of work for the weekend. And, and we appreciate that. So we'll do our best to kind of keep you guys up with, um, you know, hopefully at least monthly episodes, try to do them, you know, kind of like we did today, maybe a little bit longer, give you a little bit more content when we do get on the radio. Cause you know, we, we just don't get that opportunity. Dan and I don't anymore that much. I mean, here we are, it's Monday the 9th. It's almost 11 o'clock now. We, you know, we got work and stuff to do tomorrow too. So, uh, if it's not a podcast night, I can tell you I've, I've been long asleep <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so, um, we appreciate the patience and just know that we're doing the best that we can for you guys. And, um, you know, I think Dan told me he just checked the iTunes and we're sitting at 24, I think, Dan. Yeah, 24 today. So, in the out, yeah, outdoor that's, category. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, in the outdoor category. So, we really do appreciate everybody um, checking us out. If you haven't had a chance to go on there um, and leave a rating or a review, uh, we would certainly appreciate if you could do that. Um, keeping us up towards the front and, and those kinds of reviews is the best way to help us reach new listeners and get new people into the show. Um, you know, I think the last thing I'll say before we wrap up, Dan is just, you know, uh, I understand that there's a lot of, a lot of things that, you know, you can do with your time and there's a lot of podcasts to choose from out there and a lot of media content and a lot of things. So, um, whenever you do decide to click on an HP episode and, spend however long it is that it is, you know, that you do listening to it. Um, you know, I do appreciate that. And it's, it, it's truly, it is, it is very humbling, uh, when we get messages in the group and emails and things, when guys say like, Hey, I'm a new hunter. I've experienced success directly based on what I heard on your show, um, or something to that effect. And it's just, it's so cool because we, with, you know, we were just like that, you know, and, and it's not like any of us, live in the, you know, the best waterfowl hunting area or know everything there is to know about everything. Um, so again, appreciate everybody's support, uh, and patience and, um, you know, we'll do, we'll do our best to kind of plug along monthly at a minimum. That's, that's what I'll, I'll try to promise. Yep. And, and not, not only the, the new guys out there with success, but the, the seasoned hunters that say, you know, I've went back and listened and, and each time we pick up something different that I can use or that I forgot that, you know, I'm going to try next time. And, and it's just cool. You know, we're, we're in the same boat and I'll listen back sometimes and I'll be like, wow, that was a really good point that you made or one of the guests made. And, and then I'll try and apply that next time I'm out just because, you know, like you said, everything is, is a tool and there's different ways to go about it. And, and changing up the game no matter you know where you're at so it's fun it's cool it's uh it's an awesome awesome place that we live in to be able to do this and and like you said you know we we do live busy lives and and we'll try and be more regular here but um go out and enjoy it man and yeah. and share with I us mean, we have we have yeah, we have like 600 kids between the two of us and you have 599 of them. So, you know, 
<laughs> that keeps us really busy. Well, the, a, lot of, a lot of time taken up with them. The the problem, one of the biggest problems is that Josh wakes up at about 3.30 in the morning and then my kids don't go to bed till we try to get them asleep by nine, like usually in bed at 8.15 and it takes an hour before they're actually settled and not wanting an extra snack or something. So to get on here, we try and start at nine. If it's after nine, Josh is usually, you know, ready to, to lay down, which I don't blame him at all. That's a, that's a long day on his end. So, you know, trying to, trying to get that lined up and amen, we're doing it. So episode 65 in the books, brother. No doubt. All right, thanks for checking out episode 65 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. If you need to get caught up on any of the past episodes, check us out on iTunes. Jump over to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Check us out on there. Get in the HP Outdoors Waterfowl uh, Podcast listeners group and uh, chat with us online. Definitely appreciate you guys checking us out. Leave us a rating in a review if you hadn't had a chance. And until next time, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.